it's all good. Hey, hold on a second. Take a look at the shape of that. What does that remind you of? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean. Today, we are filming in Atlanta, Georgia. And the reason why I'm in Atlanta is I'm visiting my buddy Jordan. And what we're going to show you how to do today is we're going to show you how to replace the water pump, the thermostat, and replace all three drive belts on his third generation 4Runner, which has the 3RZ engine. It's a 2.7 liter four cylinder engine. And with this engine, replacing a water pump is a lot easier than the V6 engine that also came in the third generation 4Runners, the 3.4 liter. This is not nearly as involved as the 3.4 because with the 3.4 liter you have to tear apart the whole front of the engine and basically do a timing belt job to get in there to the water pump this is a whole different animal as you're going to see very soon it's way way easier so without further ado we're going to get started with this job in case you forgot what jordan looks like if you're not familiar with our channel this is jordan jordan why are you doing this job did you have a water pump failure or are you doing this as just preventative maintenance just preventative maintenance i did this job about eighty thousand miles ago and uh it seems like a pretty good interval it also coincided with wanting to do a partial coolant exchange gotcha before we get started with the job let's show you all the parts that jordan got here is the ASIN water pump. It's good to double check that it's a, a real ASIN part. They usually put a sticker on it and they have the, the mark in the casting. They also, usually Toyota was written here and they grind it off. This is the impeller that actually pumps the coolant. This is where the fan clutch and the fan pulley bolt on. It should be nice and smooth and a little bit snug. Other things you'll notice is there's holes on either side for weep holes for if coolant makes it past the bearing, it gives it a place to go. So getting back to this, yeah. they actually took Toyota's name off of there purposely. Yeah, because it's not being sold as a Toyota part, but they may be using the same mold to die cast this housing. It's easier to just grind it off. <laughs> okay, I didn't know that, because like I've seen that on other parts and that's mm -hmm. what it is, they're grinding off the Toyota name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other things to check out, this is the mating surface for the gasket. Just take a look and make sure that it isn't scratched or damaged or anything. It needs to be nice and flat. It's all good. Hey, hold on a second. Take a look at the shape of that. What does that remind you of? <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you got a dirty mind, you got that joke. Okay. <laughs> and then here's an ASIN gasket that goes with it. It's got that same funny shape to it. It sure does. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> While we're in there, we're going to throw in an ASIN thermostat what's the temperature setting of that it's 82 c 82 degrees celsius yeah. that's the same for the 3.4 i think the 3.4 may be a little higher really yeah i okay. know the 3rz runs kind of cold okay it's got the jiggle valve which will make sure to position correctly and then the asin gasket that goes on there i'm going to go ahead and replace the radiator cap as well they've updated the sticker to be for the reading impaired <laughs> okay and while we have all the belts off we'll replace the three accessory belts and those are all bando part numbers but bando is an accepted replacement it's equivalent to oem right yeah i think so it's made in japan so that can't be too bad right yeah the japanese <laughs> know what they're doing here's the ace and part number for the thermostat here's the part number for the radiator cap this is the part number for the ASN water pump. Jordan went ahead and identified what these belts are. So this is the part number for the power steering belt. This one is for the AC. And this one is for the alternator and water pump. The first thing we're gonna do is get the skid plates off. And we're not gonna show it because Jordan has some aftermarket skid plates on it. They come from the Savage Company and you're most likely not going to have these and so it's not going to have the same value but all you have to do is figure out where all the bolts are for your front skid plate and then just get them out they're usually 12 millimeter if you have stock skid plates and then you just lower to the ground so you can access everything underneath jordan dropped the front skid plate now we're going to pop the hood and we're going to get started with draining the coolant 
just like myself, Jordan has the Spiker Engineering hood struts, and look at that. They just open up the hood for you and keep it open. You don't have to use the prop rod, and the prop rod always gets in your way while you're turning wrenches, so these Spiker Engineering hood struts are pretty nice to get. I like to take the radiator cap off first. And by the way, this mm -hmm. engine is totally stone cold. We're not worried about any coolant coming up at our face. Open the cap to make sure your level is appropriate. And also by opening it, then it'll make it a lot easier for it to drain because the air can come in as the coolant goes out. Okay. This is the plastic petcock valve on this Denso radiator. This is a replacement from the original. The original had a nice little spout that would face downward and it was a lot cleaner to drain out the coolant. With just the plug, it's gonna kinda dribble out and it has a higher chance of making a mess, but we'll try not to make too much of a mess in Jordan's garage. Sucker's tight, huh? There it is. So you can let it drain forever like this. This is my method. You stick the bucket up in the way and then so that if it shoots out. Yeah, I kinda like that because like Jordan said, if you don't do that and take the plug out all the way, you could wait forever to, for the coolant to drain out. The overflow reservoir is right here near the battery. And if your coolant was really old, you would wanna take off the battery strap and then you get your hand underneath the reservoir and you pull up, it snaps into a metal bracket right up against the body here, and then you could drain it out. Because Jordan's coolant isn't that old, it's only a couple years old and it doesn't have that many miles on it. He's not gonna bother pulling this reservoir out so he can drain it out. Another way you could do it if you have a fluid suction device, you could just stick it down in there and suction the coolant out. But usually it's just easier just to pull the reservoir up out of the body and then drain it out into your catch container. While the radiator's draining, we'll get the stuff from the top of the radiator out of the way. So we have the overflow tube it's just a little spring clamp and it's connected onto this air tube so we can just bend it out of the way. The air tube just goes onto this box here and then we have two bolts and we can push it out of the way. What are you using there, Jordan? This is my T-handle wrench. Oh. I like it for stuff like this that's easy to reach. You just spin it. Nice, okay. Yeah. And we don't have to disconnect it. We can just push it out of the way. And that goes over to the EBAT box, right? It does. Okay. Yeah, right there. Now we have to pull off the upper radiator hose so that we can get to the fan shroud. I like to use just these real big old uh, slip, joint, slip pliers. joint pliers rather than channel locks. I use uh, bent nose, needle nose pliers, but those work good. Yeah. Always twist first to break the seal. Get ready because there might be a little bit of coolant that wants to pour out there. Nope, we're good. So it can just kind of hang out or push it out of the way a little bit. After the radiator finishes draining, we'll put the cap back in and then we'll take the lower shroud piece off. And what Jordan is talking about is this fan shroud is actually two pieces. It's got the main part up above, but then it's got a smaller section down below that you can disconnect from the main shroud. So you can pull this shroud directly up without first removing the fan clutch with the fan connected to it. So that's a nice design that Toyota made it into two pieces so you can remove this without having to remove the fan clutch at the same time. You can see it's still draining, but most of it has drained out and that's gonna be enough. Jordan's gonna put the plug back in. Wipe its nose. Finger tight. I mean, tight as you can go with your hand without hurting yourself. Yeah. To separate the lower shroud from the main shroud, you can see that metal clip right there. I'll point to it with my finger. It's right there. So you release a clip on both sides and then you can drop the lower shroud. You really just have to lift it over the thing. Over the little tab there. Yep. In fact, I think what I'm gonna do. Pull it from the inside too? Yeah, I'm just gonna pull the tabs off. Okay. I'm pull it from the inside also. There you go. Hello. And then it sort of rocks outward. And there's a couple little push pins. There you go. These two things right here, they hook into the shroud. So the pin goes in there. 
and then there's a little tab that goes in there and then it kind of rocks forward and then the metal clips clip in on these two sides. Okay, and this is a shot from below so you can understand what Jordan was doing because I was originally filming from up top showing you the clips. Now we're gonna get the upper shroud disconnected from the radiator and it's held on with four 10 millimeter bolts, two on each side. So you could see one right here on the upper driver's side and there's a lower one on the driver's side and Jordan's going after that one first. He's just using a short 3 8 ratchet and a 10 millimeter socket to loosen it. Okay, he's got that one. Yeah. And now he's going for the other low one on the passenger side. He's gonna now get the upper one on the driver's side. Okay, that was the last bolt. He should be able to pull this fan shroud out. So it has to clear the bottom of the fan. You want to be real careful that you don't push anything into the fins of the radiator. There it is. Jordan cut a piece of cardboard to size to protect the radiator cooling fins because if we inadvertently go this way with a tool in our hand, we're not gonna bend and mangle any of the cooling fins. Cheap insurance. All right, good. It's a good idea. This is gonna be personal preference. Some of you are, are gonna to wanna to remove the fan clutch from the water pump pulley first, but that pulley is gonna be still under tension from the alternator belt. So Jordan's choice is he's gonna remove all three drive belts and then he's gonna remove the fan clutch. So the first belt we're gonna get off is the outermost belt, which is this power steering belt right here. If you're gonna put the belts back or you have any confusion about which is which, this is a great time to go ahead and put a label. You can just write power steering or PS with Sharpie. We have to undo the tension on this tensioner. This is the idler pulley. That's a 14, there we go. So. We don't have to take this off, we just have to loosen it. There we go. And then we put a 14 on the tensioner rod and Lefty Lucy pushes it inward. So just go as far as you want. And the belt will slip off. And then you can just take it off the power steering pump, take it off the harmonic balancer and work it around the fan, just like that. The next belt back is the AC belt, and to get to that idle or tension pulley, it's best to go from underneath where Jordan currently is. You can see the pulley right there. You first have to break free that 14 millimeter nut for the pulley, and then get onto the tensioner bolt, and when you back off the tensioner bolt, then the pulley is going to be able to go upward and detension the belt. Jordan switch tools to have a little bit more leverage. The nut's kind of tight. There it goes. And there it is. Easy peasy. The last belt we have to get off is the alternator belt and the tensioner is right there. You got to loosen that 12 millimeter nut first. You have to get onto the bolt and loosen that, and then you could get the belt off. I'm gonna opt to use the long handled gear wrench. Is that a nut or a bolt? It's a bolt, actually. It's a bolt, okay. Mm -hmm. I had it wrong. Yeah, the bolt, it clamps this little square. It clamps it to the alternator. Okay, so it's a bolt. Yeah. All right. I think we also have to detension the alternator pivot. Oh yeah, the pivot bolt. So this is a shot from looking from underneath. That's the pivot bolt for the alternator. He also has to loosen that, and that's a 14 millimeter. And it's a bolt with a nut on the back. Okay, so do so, you have to actually hold that nut on the back? I think you do. Okay. Let me try just breaking this loose and see what the nut does. It might be fine. It just has to be loose. It doesn't have to come out all the way. It's just so the alternator can pivot once you start adjusting the belt adjuster. Go. 
then same thing, we have to get it over the fan blades. <laughs> Just spin the fan and work it around. There yeah. it is. Now we're going to take off the four 12 millimeter nuts that hold the fan clutch to the water pump pulley. There's different methods for how you can hold the assembly steady while you're breaking free one of the nuts. Jordan is going to use a two wrench technique. Another way to do it is I usually wedge a pry bar or a big screwdriver between two neighboring nuts while I'm breaking free a third nut. So let's see how well Jordan's method works. Nice, works good. And you spin it and get the next one in position. How do you get the last one free though? Because <laughs> then all the other three will be loose. Yeah. So I think I will actually stick a wrench between a couple of the nuts. There you go. If you're gonna use a wrench or a pry bar, big screwdriver method to wedge in between, what you wanna do is keep the nuts on. You wouldn't wanna remove the nuts all the way and then be grinding up against the threads of the studs because then you'd ruin them. Now we are replacing the water pump, but if for some reason you were removing the fan clutch for another reason, you wouldn't want to damage the threads on it. And then this way you don't have a hard time getting the nuts back on. So now we should be able to spin all four of them off by hand. I've got a rag down there, so I just let them drop. That actually came off really easy. A few years ago, I replaced the fan just because it was looking kind of old and brittle. So yours will maybe a little more yellow, but when they're brand new, they're pretty much clear white like this. That comment I made about him easily being able to separate the flange of the fan clutch from the fan pulley is for the 3.4 liter, it's very common that the fan clutch gets kind of stuck onto the studs. You'll end up having to really pull and rock the fan clutch back and forth. And then what can happen, and one of the reasons why it's good to put a protector of some cardboard in front of your radiator is you can pull back with enough force and slam it into your cooling fins and damage them. But that actually came off super, super easy. I've never seen one come off that easy. Now we'll also go ahead and pull off the pulley, the water pump pulley. I called it the fan pulley, but I guess it is technically the water pump pulley. Yeah, it's both. It's both, <laughs> okay. One thing we can do while we have this out Usually there's a lot of dust that accumulates inside. We can just clean it out. Probably sh shoot some brake cleaner in there too. Yeah, if you feel like you need it. It's usually just dust. The next thing we need to do is get the dipstick out of the way. And to get the dipstick out of the way, we need to get this harness out so we can get to that 12 millimeter bolt. So we pull the release tab and it should just slide out of the way. Yep, no big deal. Easy peasy. Now we can take a 12 millimeter deep socket The dipstick plugs into the oil pump right here. I'm getting a shot from down below, so he's gonna pull up on the dipstick and remove it. There it is. So you'll see right there, there's a rubber O-ring that seals that to the oil pump housing. And that's something you probably will want to replace. And we'll try to get you a part number for that. But if you have just a universal metric o-ring set you can just find one that fits that and that's what jordan has but i'll try to locate a part number for you and add that into the video description at a later date and here's a shot from above looking down where the oil dipstick plugs into the oil pump here's a slick little kit that jordan actually got from harbor freight it's got all the different metric size o-rings pretty nice kit item 67580 so we found that the O-ring that's listed as a 012, I don't really know anything about O-ring sizing. Seems like it goes on there just fine. I think that'll work. One thing that I believe is a good idea is you plug off the dipstick hole with something like a silicone plug, because when you're removing the water pump, there could be some dirt and debris that falls off and also maybe some coolant leaks out. And 
you really don't want to get any debris or coolant draining into your oil pan so Jordan's gonna block it off with the plug that he found it's just something he got from some application and it's kind of hard to see because it's black and it's dark down there but he's got it plugged off now we're ready to finally take off the bolts that hold the water pump to the engine block it's a series of 12 millimeter bolts and 10 millimeter bolts and as we take them off we're going to put them into the holes of the new water pump as a template just to show you where all the bolts go so you know where the 10 millimeter bolts are and the 12 millimeter bolts are so what i'm doing for you is i'm just showing a quick shot starting from the passenger side and show you where the fasteners are you can see i'm coming down right from the oil fill cap and you can see some 12 millimeter bolts there and then going down below you can see some 10 millimeter ones and then it looks like there's more 10 millimeter on this side too the reason why i'm showing you this now because when jordan's in there with his wrench i'm not going to be able to effectively film and show you as well as i can right now all right jordan's going to start on the passenger side okay so we have our two 12s are loose so that one's on the far end and that one's in the middle and those are the same size yes they are okay they're the same so, size looking at the new pump there we go okay so two 12s right there and then here's a good shot you can tell that 12s those bottom ones are all 10s i think the rest of them are all 10s huh they are so it's two 12 millimeter bolts and then the rest are all 10s looks like eight eight 10 millimeter okay Does the 3RZ have a block drain? It probably does. When we remove the water pump, we're gonna get some coolant that's gonna come out from the block. So I have a drain pan down below, and I just have a plastic bag over my harmonic balancer just to minimize the mess a little bit. There probably is a block drain somewhere on here, but we're not gonna bother with the block drain. We just realized once the water pump is separated from the engine block, there is gonna be coolant that's gonna come out. These are all the same size. So all the 10 millimeter bolts are the same length? Yes. One nice thing that Toyota quite often does for us is they make the like fasteners all the same length. So the two 12 millimeter bolts are the same length and then all of the eight 10 millimeter bolts are all the same length. So Jordan will pull them out and show you that. So you don't have to worry about mixing them up. So it doesn't matter the order you take them off and you have to keep track of where you pull them out of because they're all the same length. So that's a nice thing that Toyota does for us. Okay, so now for the moment of truth, Jordan is gonna separate the water pump from the block. Just gonna pull on it a little bit and there we go. There's a gush of coolant, a lot of coolant. It's a gusher. It's a gusher. <laughs> Yeah, good thing I put that yep. drain there. Yep, that pan kind of saved the mess. In case you wanted to use the block drain, instead of just pulling the water pump off and having a bunch of coolant come out at you, I'm going to show you where it's at. If you go into the passenger side fender well and you go underneath the upper control arm on the front side and you look underneath here towards the block you'll see a silver bolt and you could see a silver bolt all by itself way back there and that is the block drain and it doesn't have a nice little tube that you can maybe connect up some vinyl tubing or any other type of rubber hose to direct it into a catch basin so when you open that up it's just going to dribble out along the block and hit whatever it's going to hit along the way and deflect off and good luck trying to capture it all. You'll have to do what Jordan did and have a nice big wide pan so you can collect it so it doesn't make a mess where you're working. And that block drain looks to be a 14 millimeter. That's what they've been in the past. So that's what I would suggest starting off with. You just have to come in with a really long extension or string a bunch of them together and you can get to it right from the wheel well. 
The next thing that Jordan's gonna do is he's gonna take a nice close look at the surface of the block where the water pump seals to, and he's gonna make sure that's nice and clean. This is probably the most important thing you're gonna do as part of this job is make sure that the surface is ready to accept the new gasket and the new water pump. If you don't spend some time and make sure that surface is nice and clean and flat, you're gonna do yourself a disservice because you're gonna get it all back together, get the coolant filled, and then realize you got a leak and now you have to repeat all that work. So take your time and make sure that the surface of the block is nice and clean. We've taken off the water pump and now we're gonna pull the gasket off. Take a look at the surface. And that surface looks fairly clean, but he's gonna to wanna to get on there with like a light scotch bright pad or something of that nature and just clean off any of the gunk. And then you also wanna look for any pitting. Now on this 3RZ, I don't know if this is a common thing with this engine, but I know with the 5VZ, the 3.4 liter V6, sometimes you'll see some pitting on the block surface and that pitting could be a potential spot where coolant could get past the gasket. And so I've actually done this on one of my engines. I smeared a little bit of the 1282B FIPG. That's meant for coolant applications with Toyota engines to fill in the deep pitting so I make sure I don't get a leak when I put the new water pump on. So that's one of the things you want to be looking for is any significant pitting in the surface of the block. I think that the stuff on the gasket surface is just leftover gasket material. So I'm gonna start with a cotton rag and some rubbing alcohol and just see if it cleans up. He's gonna clean it up and make sure he's happy with the surface before he puts the new gasket on. Jordan has the block surface as clean as he likes and now we're gonna get the new gasket in place and then slide the water pump over. Now this one doesn't have any studs. Sure. You have to go in with both of them at the same time, huh? So what I'm gonna do is put the gasket on here and then actually I'm gonna go ahead and just put the two long ones through to align it. There we go. So different engines have different setups. On the 3.4 liter engine on the third gen 4Runner, they actually have studs mm -hmm. and then you can slide the gasket on first and the studs that are in the block are gonna hold the gasket in place and then you can slide the water pump over. But in this application, Jordan's being smart and using a couple of long bolts as a placeholder for the gasket to keep it in place. And he's gonna get them both in at the same time. And I pretty much just wiped it out with alcohol. So you didn't take any scrubby no, it didn't sponge it. to it? Okay. You can see why it's nice to have the cardboard. I don't have to worry about scratching anything. Let me line the two bolts up here and actually Tim, I don't know if you can hand you me. Get another 10 millimeter? Hand me just one of those. And then... Yeah. So he's going to also get a 10 millimeter one lined up on the driver's side. This way the there. gasket can't fall down. Yeah, now it's captured. Jordan's going to get all of the 12 millimeter and 10 millimeter bolts started. And then we'll come back for the torquing sequence. For this job, Jordan has a factory service manual for his year forerunner. Here is an example of a misprint in a factory service manual. It's not super common, but it's common enough to where you have to be careful and pay attention and don't be fooled by a misprint. So they actually say it's 14 millimeter bolts and 12 millimeter bolts, but it's actually 12 millimeter bolts and 10 millimeter bolts. They give the torque spec, so the 12 millimeter bolts should be 18 foot pounds and the 10 millimeter bolts are 78 inch pounds. So we just have to hope that that isn't also a misprint. So these are the torque specs we are gonna use for the tightening. And we just have to hope that this wasn't also a misprint in the factory service manual. A way you could double check the torque spec for the size of the bolt you're working on is you could find these pages in the factory service manual. It says standard bolt, how to determine bolt strength and it's on page SS1. For the 10 millimeter bolts, Jordan has determined based off of the hash pattern on the head of the bolt that it's this one right here. And that's a what, 8T, okay? We're gonna actually just assume that it's one class lower. The 10 millimeter headed bolts are a six millimeter diameter shaft. 
and the 12 millimeter headed bolts are an eight millimeter diameter shaft. So we'll use the six and eight. And then if we go over to the flange bolt. Yep. And so you can look up mm -hmm. above, that's the foot pound column at the top. Yep. So small one is nine, and then the big one is 21. So if we go back and look at our specs, the big one is 18. That's pretty close. That's a good ballpark. The small one, nine foot pounds, what's nine times 12? Yeah. So 78, it's a little bit lower. So this is a good ballpark. If this was twice or 10 X or something, you'd go, okay, yeah, something's definitely wrong. So these are reasonable. Okay. Yeah. The factory service manual doesn't actually have a tightening sequence per se, but it's always good practice when you're putting something onto the engine with multiple fasteners, you first bring them down all flush by hand with a socket and maybe an extension. And then you go around in a crisscrossing pattern, slowly bringing them up snugger. And what Jordan is gonna use is he's gonna use a short 3 8 ratchet. It's the same gear wrench ratchet I have in my tool arsenal. And he's just gonna get them all cinched up pretty snug. And then he's gonna go to the torque wrench and get them to the torque spec. I've got the inch pound torque wrench set to 78 and we're gonna do the 10 millimeter headed bolts first and then I'll do the 12s after. And again, Jordan's gonna do this in a crisscrossing pattern and bring them all up to the 78 inch torque spec. Now we have the 12 millimeter socket on for the two last bolts and the torque wrench is set to 216 inch pounds. You convert from foot pounds to inch pounds just by multiplying the value by 12, 216. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right, the water pump is now properly torqued to the block. Now we're gonna work on the thermostat and it's right here on the driver's side of the engine. You can see the power steering pump. You go right below the power steering pump and it's right there. Okay, we have two 12 millimeter headed nuts. I'm not even gonna bother to take the hose off because this casting will separate. So the offset wrench works pretty well in here. Sorry. Jordan switched to his little shorty 3 8 ratchet. He's gonna get them a little bit looser so he can take them off by hand. Okay, now we're gonna separate, get a little more coolant coming out. Notice the jiggle valve. It's basically right at the end of this casting here. It's basically right between the two studs. And notice also the conical part is what faces outward. There we go. There it is. Here's the new face and thermostat and the new ace and gasket. When you buy a thermostat, you would think it's gonna come with the gasket it needs, but that's not the case. They always sell these things separately, as far as I can tell for the Toyota applications that I've worked on. So don't order the thermostat and then forget to order the gasket separately because then you'll be upset because you're either gonna have to wait to get a thermostat gasket if your local Toyota dealer doesn't have it in stock, or you're gonna to have to just reuse the old one, which is not ideal. So the gasket has a little slit on the inside and it just goes around this stamped metal. So you just work it around, basically an O-ring, and then press it inward to make sure that it's all the way around and that's how it should look. Now it's ready to go. Okay. So when we put the new thermostat in, notice that it says it wants to be within 15 degrees of the prescribed position, which is basically facing straight up and down. It's not actually halfway between the studs. It's rather up and down vertically with the ground. So basically it should be close to the 12 o'clock position. Yeah. We've wiped the extra coolant out of here. We wiped it out of the, the water outlet casting as well. And then one other thing before you put that in, Jordan, what I've found again with my experience with the 3.4 liter V6 engine, I have seen fairly significant pitting on some of them on the water neck itself. Mm -hmm. So you wanna take a look at that surface and make sure that it's not really pitted yeah. from corrosion. And then you also wanna look on the engine side to make sure there's no significant pitting or any type of deposits to hinder a good seal of the thermostat gasket. So if you look at the water outlet here, there's actually a casting line and then there's also a little tab. I think this is the gate from the die casting. And this looks like the up position. So I'm gonna align the jiggle valve with that. Okay. We put it in with the cone facing out. There we go. Just 
stick this right back on. And it, all it's doing is compressing that rubber gasket. So you just want to make sure that as you're tightening it, as it's coming together, that the gasket is still seating in the right place. And the two metal pieces should come together without any trouble, just a little bit of compression. If it's cockeyed, then that means that the thermostat is hung up in there. Jordan is once again using that little short 3 8 ratchet and then just bringing them up snug equally. So it turns a little bit on one side, then goes back to the other side. You just want to avoid tightening down one side all the way first. That's not good practice. There, that one's touched off. And so is that one. The torque value for those two thermostat housing nuts is 15 foot-pounds. If you want to use your inch-pound torque wrench, multiply by 12, and it's 180 inch-pounds. And Jordan is using his inch-pound torque wrench for this. I think what I'm going to have to do is get... An extension? Yeah, that's what I'm going to have to do. There we go. Okay, we're going to reverse our procedure now. We're going to first get the oil dipstick back connected. So I just put a drop of engine oil on the new O-ring just so that it slides in more easily. Pop it into there. Well, you'll know if it's popped in all the way when the bowl hole lines up on the dipstick. Oh yeah, true enough. Lined up. Nope. Needs to pop in more, huh? Maybe that O-ring is just a little bit bigger diameter than the... Uh... Oh, there we go. There it is. No, it just took a little tiny bit of force. Okay. Yeah, so now it lines up and the bracket has a little tab that wants to go on the side. So we're gonna put it in the bolt there. We don't have a torque spec for this. Jordan's just gonna go by feel. It's probably about 15 or 16. It's to that German spec we all know and love, good in tight. And it's appropriate because Jordan is of German descent. <laughs> <laughs> After we bolt on the dipstick tube and the little bracket, snap the connector back in place. There we go. Next, we're gonna slide the water pump pulley over the studs of the water pump. Now Jordan is gonna slide the fan with the fan clutch into position over the studs. And then he's gonna get the four nuts started. To tighten these fan clutch nuts, Jordan is gonna use the trick of wedging in a screwdriver in between two neighboring nuts and then tighten up the third nut. And he's just gonna go by feel with the box end wrench because you can't really get a torque wrench in there. So just go by feel and don't go too crazy and end up stripping the nuts. So we found this worked really well is to use a flat screwdriver that has kind of a broad head. Stick it up underneath one nut and then kind of hold it up against the fan clutch. Then you can get onto the next nut and tighten it. It sort of supports it between the nut and the shaft of the fan clutch. Progress to the next one, and then it's locked in. Okay, I tighten that one already. Jordan got all the fan clutch nuts tight. Now we're gonna start getting the belts on, and we have to put the backmost belt on first, and that's the alternator belt. So he's gotta fit it over the fan, and then once it's over the fan, it went around the water pump pulley, around the alternator pulley, and onto the crank pulley. We need to tighten the tensioner here and then lock it down on the tensioner and then also lock it down on the pivot. So a flex head ratchet actually works really nice to get in here because we just have to run it up until it's tight. The proper tension on a belt can be done a couple different ways. One way is just by feel. You grab in between two pulleys midpoint and you push and pull on the belt and you should get somewhere between a half an inch to three quarters of an inch of deflection, which means you should be able to push the belt about a half inch to three quarters of an inch away from the center line. And then you should be able to pull it towards you that same amount away from the center line. So Jordan's gonna demonstrate that he's gonna grab and he's gonna push and pull on it. And you just kinda eyeball it and go by feel. The other way is you use a belt tension gauge and I have one that I like from OTC and I'll link that one in the video description. I don't obviously have it here because we're in Atlanta and all my tools are back in San Jose, California. Now we're gonna torque the lock nut for the adjuster for the alternator belt and the pivot bolt. 
The torque spec for the pivot bolt is 43 foot-pounds and the torque spec for the lock nut for the adjuster is 21 foot-pounds. Jordan isn't going to bother with the torque spec. He's just going to go by feel and use that German spec of good and tight. The flex head ratchet works pretty nice. You're tightening the nut, huh? Yep, that's the best way to do it, actually. There we go. Okay, it's plenty tight. So Jordan just tightened the nut on the back side. He didn't actually access the bolt on the front side. Now he's just tightening the lock nut for the adjuster. The next belt forward is the AC belt. For the AC belt, Jordan is going to get that installed from the underside. That's the easiest way to do it. So he's getting it onto the crank pulley first and then onto the AC compressor pulley. And then finally, he's going to get it onto the AC idler pulley below. There it is. And then now he just has to tighten up the adjuster bolt and get the belt tensioned to where he wants it. I'm going to start bringing this one in just a little bit so that it's more in line. Okay, just getting it closer to the bracket that attaches to, but not tight. Right, correct. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that feels about right. Yeah. Think it's too loose? No. Okay. I think that's pretty good. The torque spec for the lock nut for the AC idler pulley is 22 foot pounds, but Jordan is just gonna go by feel. Now for the last belt, which is the power steering belt. This one also has to go over the fan first. And that one has to go over the crank pulley below too, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to take a little bit more tension off that idler pulley to get the new belt in place. There it is. And now he's just going to tension up the bolt and get the belt to the tension he likes. The reason why you want the proper tension on the belt is for two reasons. Number one, you don't want it so loose that the belt will slip on the pulleys. And number two, if you have the tension super, super tight, it's going to put stress on all the bearings that the pulleys run on. And then you could get a premature failure of the bearings for the power steering pulley, for the alternator pulley, and for the AC pulley and your idler pulleys. So it's just a fine line. You want them tight enough, but not so tight that you damage the bearings. Now he's gonna tighten up that power steering idler pulley. The torque spec for that AC idler pulley bolt is 29 foot pounds. Now Jordan is just removing his protective cardboard out of the way, because we're now gonna get the fan shroud back connected. And he's just gonna now get all four 10 millimeter bolts started. So now Jordan is just gonna cinch them all up with his little shorty 3 8 ratchet. We don't have a torque spec for this because it's not a huge deal. You just wanna get them cinched up snug enough to where they're not gonna fall off. This is not so critical that you'd have a major engine failure if one of these bolts came loose. If you're one of those people that live and die by the torque spec, well, start living a little and trusting yourself and know how to properly tighten something without stripping it or having the bolt fall out. Or go get your own FSM. <laughs> yeah, or go get your own factory service manual. <laughs> but you really should, as a do-it-yourself auto mechanic, learn how you can tighten fasteners properly without having to rely on a torque value. Now Jordan is going to go underneath and get that lower shroud connected. So he's plugging the lower shroud into those clips and pinholes on the bottom. And now he's going to get the clips installed onto the main shroud. So the shroud goes on the outside like that. Then the square hole goes towards the outside, clips over that tab. There we go. I'm going to get the one on the driver's side. Mm -hmm. All right, the lower shroud's in place. And just to give you a shot from the underside, this is where the lower shroud plugs into the main shroud with that pin on the passenger side. 
and then this is where it clips into that clip right there. So that's what he was getting connected first before he got the clips installed up above. Now let's reattach the radiator hose. And we didn't say it before, but this is the opportune time to renew the upper and lower radiator hoses if your hoses are old. Jordan's hoses are in really good shape. He replaced them not too long ago. So that's why as part of this job, he's not renewing these hoses. But what I think I'll do for you because it is a natural time to replace them, I'll go to Toyota and look up some part numbers for you for this upper and that lower radiator hose down there. And so you could have them in case you wanna order them. Now we're gonna put this air hose back in place. The end goes underneath the radiator hose. And then there's just the two clip nuts on the top of the radiator shroud. That's interesting that they use a fancy pipe. The 5VZ, this thing just goes over and like clips into some clips on the plenums and then goes over towards the air box. Oh, okay. But these use a fancy tube. And then finally, we have the radiator overflow hose. It's just a little spring clamp. And then now it's time to fill it with fluid. Do you have a spill-free funnel? Yeah. All right, he's got a Lyle spill-free funnel yeah. and we're gonna fill it up with some coolant, which is a 50-50 mix of the red concentrate and distilled water. So here's the Lyle spill-free funnel and it comes with a multitude of different adapters and different size caps. And Jordan has already figured out which adapter and cap is gonna work. So you want an adapter that fits in the hole of the filler neck, and then you want a cap that will come down on top of that and secure it in place tightly. So this is really tight and there's not gonna be any leak. And then he just plugs in the spill-free funnel in there and then before you start filling it, you just wanna make sure that all of your coolant hoses are attached. You have the pet cock valve on the bottom of the radiator properly tightened. So you're not filling in a 50-50 mix of coolant and distilled water, and it's just draining out below your truck, which I'm sure lots of guys have done. So I had a fresh jug of concentrate and an empty jug that I kept from a previous project. So I also got a gallon of distilled water from the grocery store and then just poured half of the concentrate into the empty one and then topped them both off with each with half of the distilled water gallon. So now they're both mixed 50-50. Perfect. Okay, you get the idea. We're gonna keep on filling this till it's not taking any more coolant and then we're gonna start the engine. All right, the engine stopped taking coolant now we're gonna start the engine. So this is the time that you wanna double check and make sure you didn't leave any rags on top of the engine, any tools in the way of pulleys. Just make sure you're not gonna regret not doing a double take of the top of the engine and you didn't leave something that's gonna get caught in the belts or the pulleys. To properly burp a cooling system, you're gonna want the heater control valves all the way hot, which opens up the heater control valve so coolant can flow through the heater core and heater core hoses. And then if you have a rear heater, which Jordan has on his third gen 4Runner, you're gonna wanna turn the temperature control all the way hot too. Now, you don't have to actually have the fan on to blow heat, you just have to have the valves open so the coolant flows through the entire system so you can get most of the air out because you don't want significant air trapped in the system. You wanna get most of it out while you're doing this burping procedure. And then one other thing I'll say is that if you can, if you can get the front end higher than the rear, that's ideal. So if we were in his driveway, which is sloping towards the street, that would be ideal to have the front of the vehicle near the garage and the back end towards the street because air rises if the front end is higher than the rear end you'll naturally be able to get more air out of the system but flat ground works okay and because the spill free funnel is now the highest point in the cooling system it is going to work fairly well to get the air out of the system so go ahead you can start it jordan So what you're going to 
to notice is air bubbles are going to be coming up into the spill-free funnel, letting you know that air is working its way out of the system. So you can see air bubbles coming up. And then another thing you can do to expedite it if you want, you can raise the RPMs a little bit. So we're just going to let this run for a while and let air work its way out. To get the funnel off and save this extra fluid, we're going to squeeze the, the upper radiator hose a little bit and then stick that down in it. Give it a little twist so it comes off gently. And you can put it back in your bucket. Another option is if you did drain out your reservoir, then what you can do is what's left over from the spill-free funnel, you can fill up your reservoir. And because the engine is warm, you'd want to fill it to the top line so it's all the way full. And then one other thing to note is over time, you're going to get more air working its way out of the system. Every time I've done a coolant flush or any job that required me to drain the coolant out of the system, you're not going to get all the air out from the burping procedure. Just check the level in your reservoir a couple days later and just top it off. And you might have to do that for about a week and then finally it'll stabilize because all the air has worked its way out of the system and the level is not going to drop on you anymore. And so then you just want to get your cap back on. We're going to put a, put a fresh radiator cap on. And like Tim said, we can check the level. So we'll top it up to full. I can see the line from where I am. Yeah, you can see the line from the other side. Now that we've got everything buttoned back up, the cooling system is topped off. We're just going to take it for a little test drive and make sure everything is working properly. And the engine isn't actually overheating. So we'll be watching carefully that scan gauge and just making sure that the cooling system is working like it should. All right, we are all done with this job. As you saw, not a very hard job to replace the water pump and thermostat on the Toyota 3RZ engine. It's about as easy of a water pump replacement you're gonna find on a Toyota engine, especially compared to the 5VZ where you basically have to do a whole timing belt job. A much, much bigger job on that engine. There it is there. We thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean and special guest Jordan. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed yet, click that subscribe button and also click on that notification bell if you'd like to be notified when we put up a new video on our channel. Peace out. Happy wrenching. Sick mods and sick water pump and thermostat replacements on the Toyota 3RZ engine. Bye-bye.